Best best fast food burger there is. That it is. Tony and Marcolini. Sister over, you know, Wait, who gets hang the call on. tomorrow night. Um, and so much problem. Got it. <laughs> We're done. Hi, everybody. I'm Tony Marcolini. I'm a, a professor and an attorney here in the great state of New Jersey. I'm joined today with my co host, um, Marty Mangello and John Hartman. And we have a very special guest today who I'm super excited about. Uh, his name is Michael Angeli. Uh, many of you hello. probably, hello, Michael. There he is. Hello. Pleasure. He, he has had uh, an amazing career uh, in the entertainment business as an author of a couple of books, uh, also as an executive producer and a screenwriter with, um, I think, monstrously successful uh, projects. Uh, mm -hmm. you, he's an Emmy-nominated, uh, Peabody Award-winning writer, and we I can't tell you how excited we are to have you here, Michael. Oh, thank you. You flatter me. <laughs> <laughs> I, and if um, I could, I want to take, I, before we get into your your whole career, um, I want to remind people that you, you have a, a blog right now called Sistine Pantry, and it yes. literally kind of starts back at the beginning of your career. Uh, and yeah, I hope, kind of. I hope you're turning going to turn that into a, a memoir of some kind about your life, because I've been following it. It's very interesting. And I oh, tell you, okay. I laughed out loud. Some of the stories, as people may not know, but you actually ghost wrote the um, the book for Roseanne Barr. Yes. And you tell yes. some really funny stories. Could you share one of them with us? Well, I'm sure. Um, I guess uh, from the very beginning, um, I, I knew Roseanne and Tom because I had done a, when I wrote for Esquire, I'd done a profile on Tom Arnold. And so we stayed we stayed friends and we kind of lived in the same neighborhood. And so we got invited to Roseanne and Tom's bar mitzvahs and their parties and um, and whatnot. And uh, and so I, I met Rosie and we kind of got to know each other. And then one day I got a call um, and Tom would call me like, little buddy, hey, little buddy, guess what? Rosie's gonna let you write her autobiography and she's on the other line and says, it's all done, completely done. All you have to do is, you just have to edit it. We're going to pay you a shitload of money, and all you have to do is edit it. I don't know if I'm allowed to say shit. but um, You can, because we're just streaming, so it's okay. Oh, fantastic. Um, you're going to make a fucking lot of money. Um, so um, we happened to be with the same agency. We were both with William Morris at the time, and, and they made this incredible deal. I mean, back then, I think it was 1995, I believe, and they were going to pay me well, they did pay me like about $200,000 to edit a book. I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be the easiest money I ever made. So I went to, she said, come in, come in. I will give you pages of the book. And this is after we we met a second time and she had 16 personalities at the time. So, um, <laughs> and she was trying to integrate. She was trying to get down to 14 um, and each, it's funny. I mean, if she was faking, she faked really well because she, each personality had a, had a, its own voice and its own handwriting and whatnot. So, um, so that kind of was one complication of working on the book. But then the biggest complication was when I went to her house and she gave me the book and it was 
12 pages and it was <laughs> it was a stream of consciousness poem it was Ian oh, Cummings it had no punctuation or anything and and that's all she had and I tried not to panic I said no big deal we I got this I totally got it. we can we can do this and uh, so how long do you do you have? And they said, Tom and Rosie both said in unison, six weeks. Yeah. So what they had done is they made a deal with um, Ballantine Books and they took um, they took a two million dollar advance. Oh my and god. They had, they had a year to write the book and they waited until six weeks were up and then they called me. So um, so if there was anything like Vietnam, it was that. I had to during the day, Rosie would tell me stories in my tape recorder, and then at night I would, you know, I would transpose them and try and make some sense out of them and turn them into a book in six weeks. And then on top of that, if you work for Tom and Roseanne, you, you're on 24-hour call, which means if Rosie wants to go out and go party hopping or go to a bar or go to the whiskey or whatever, you have to, you have to go. That's in your contract almost. So... Um, one night I got a call and it was PTA night. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I gotta go to PTA. My wife's not gonna not gonna speak to me again if I miss PTA. And Roseanne said, You gotta come. I wanna go, I wanna go out, and you have to get a date for for Tom's assistant. And Tom had this gorgeous assistant who he was sleeping with. And Roseanne and her thinking thought that if I got one of my friends to go out with her and I went out with Roseanne, like I'm a you know, we went on a double double date. That uh, that everything would be fine. And so the first thing that happened is my wife said, "If you go to this thing, I'm going to the Peninsula Hotel and I'm going to stay there for a week." So I'm like freaked out. Like I, I went to see my kids. Uh, uh, I went to the PTA meeting early just to see my my kids' teacher because I felt so bad. And then I was so depressed when I saw Rosie. She says, "What's the matter? You you look all depressed. Here, take this." And she. She jammed like a black Cadillac in my mouth. And I don't know if you know what black Cadillacs are, but they're incredibly powerful diet pills. My my mother used to take them and hallucinate that she was St. Teresa. But um, so I, I figured if I swallowed one of these, I'd have a terrible night and I wouldn't be able to work when I got home. So I had to fake like I took it, <laughs> happy. Uh, and so we went to this place called the Whiskey, and it wasn't the Whiskey a Go Go. It was the Whiskey oh. inside the Sunset Marquee Hotel. It's a private, private club. And so the first thing Rosie did was order all of this food. And I'm thinking, wow. I mean, she's she's a big lady, but I, why does she want all this food? And then I realized she wanted to throw the food. So she she hit Eric Clapton in the back of the head with a hamburger. She she threw French fries at Shannon Doherty. And so finally, I'm like, this is a bad double date. We, we, have to, we have to get out of here right now. So she said, all right, I want to go to the pleasure chest. Now, I don't know if you know what the pleasure chest is, but it's a very famous sort of adult uh, bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard. And it's open uh, on Sunset Boulevard. It's open all night. Uh, and they sell um, toys. They sell sex toys and whatnot. So I went there with Rosie, and by, and by I'm now, at friend, this point, at this point, you're imagining the divorce papers in your head, right? Uh, yeah, this is this is hideous. <laughs> like this my is wife like, will be quoting this <laughs> right out of yeah. yeah. Twelve thirty in the morning. So, um, Roseanne kind of like moseys around this 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 uh, adult bookstore, and she ends up buying forty pieces of it looks like pla fake plastic dog poop, forty of them. And I said, what, what, are you, what are you possibly going to do with that? And she said, tomorrow I'm going to put it on all of the desks of my employees. That's their <laughs> first shit. So that was, her, that was her big joke to me. Then she, that bought a pair, she bought a pair of fake breasts then um, <laughs> so that we, we could drive up and down Sunset and she could be out of the sunroof and say, look at my breasts to everybody. So oh. that was my evening. My, my wife went to the peninsula and, um, and I, I managed to get the book together, but it was, it was just, you know, event after event like that, that were nightmares. And it ended up where Tom and Roseanne would fight constantly. They, 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 
physically they would fight, you know, and and they try and get me in between them and get them get me to settle their 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 fights. And finally, I said, you know what, I am not going to be a party to, you know, your domestic quarrels. You guys are going to have to settle your problems yourself. Well, we want you to come with us. You have to come with us, and we're going to work on the book, and we're going to go to Ottumwa, Iowa. So Ottumwa, Iowa is where Tom was from. And they Ray were O'Reilly's hometown, right? Mash, Ray yeah. O'Reilly. Wasn't he from there? Yeah. That's right. He was. Um, so they were building their their Xanadu there, which was, you know, it was like this incredibly, I saw the plans for it. They had dug the foundation, but it was like, it really was like Xanadu. It was ridiculous, absurdly large. And they had uh, they had a mobile home that was probably bigger than my house um, near the property where they stayed when they wanted to go to Ottumwa because they also had a diner there called the Big Food Diner where they would serve these loose meat sandwiches, very famous. Um, so we went to, we, we were going to go to Ottumwa, but I hurt my neck and I was in like this Pez dispenser kind of thing, this Philadelphia collar and my wife said, you are not going to Ottumwa, Iowa with Tom and Roseanne. You have to rest and you have to take care of yourself. So my, my wife and Roseanne got in this huge argument and my wife hung up on Roseanne. And this was a Saturday. Roseanne showed up at the house with a limousine and two like weight lift, weightlifters, bodybuilders to carry me through the airport. And I kid you not, the reigning Miss Iowa was going to carry my bags. I carried my bags. So we, my wife sort of agreed that, okay, you can go as, as long as the weightlifters carry you. So we go to Ottumwa and I try and work on the book, but they want to drive around. And, you know, they like, like sort of wave at some of the farm people because the farm people just loved Tom and Roseanne. So they would just drive around and wave and stuff. But, but Roseanne and Tom were having this huge argument. And I was in the back with Roseanne's, assistant and Tom's assistant, both of whom are, are like beautiful, right? Young, beautiful women. Um, so we were like children, the three of us. And Tom and Roseanne kept hitting each other. Roseanne was just pounding on Tom's arm while he was driving. So he, um, he pulled a sweatshirt over her head, her sweatshirt over her head so she'd stop hitting him. And she hit the door, the, the door latch. The door opened. Thank God we were only going like 20 miles an hour. She fell out of the car and was like running down the country road with this sweatshirt over her head. So those are the kind of nightmares that I had after. Um, we I've, finally I've, got got some, the I've got some footage here of the mansion if we want to take a peek real quick. Um, I don't the, know if you have. If you've seen how it is looking these days, but uh, here, let's take a look, guys, and see what's going on. Just uh, out of curiosity, at worst, um, I sure. think everybody everybody can see uh, my screen, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, now here's what's going on. Given the recent controversies and the Iowa connection, we decided to make the drive down to Eldon this afternoon to take a look at. <laughs> It doesn't. It doesn't look that good. There it is. That's it. That's it. Looks like a set for The Walking Dead. Yes, Xanadu. <laughs> Rosebud. Well, those trees are pretty big. How long ago was this? Twenty years ago? Twenty-five? Yeah, it's a long time ago. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That looks a bit very different. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it does, guys. All right. Uh, one more, too. I just wanted to mention um, I couldn't help but take a look at the peninsula. Uh, I hope your wife enjoyed the peninsula of Beverly Hills. She did. She did very much. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's she's a, in a very nice place. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's uh, about three miles from our home, actually, where she's she spent a number of nights there, actually. Uh, whenever we fight, she threatened to go to the peninsula, and she would go because it, it was so wow. expensive. Wow! Yeah, look, yeah. look. Now looks I have cool. a, I have to take you in because there's so much I want to get to in such a short period sure. of time. Now I know the uh, first, I believe, the first project you sold was was a sketch artist. 
Is that correct? That's right. That's right. With Sean Young and Jeff Fahey. And I were the stars. I, I was very curious. The first time you saw something that you wrote actually being performed, what was that uh -huh. experience like? Well, I was sort of, um, I was kneaded and stewed like meat. I mean, because I had seen it made and it was such a, it was another like really enervating experience. You know, I really didn't expect it to be that way. I thought it was going to be all seashells and balloons and lovely. And it was just such a, such a excruciating experience to, um, to, to see it be made. And plus I didn't like Jeff Fahey as a star. I thought that he was, he lacked some intellect a little bit for the role. Um, he was very good, but I, I he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have been my first choice. But but then, yes, yeah, seeing it made, we had a big, um, uh, we, we had a screening and at the, uh, at the, let's see, the Director's Guild in, in Hollywood. And uh, Mickey Dolez was there. Talk about dropping names. Um, and it was really terrific to see it made. It really was. It was, um, you know, it was, um, I, I, had, I had envisioned it many, many times of seeing my stuff on the big screen. And like now I saw it and and there was one line and that I tried to get changed, but I fought with the director to the nail and it was Baden Papa Michael, who was a very famous cinematographer. Um, and he, but he directed this film, Sketch Artist. And the line was, we need some DNA. We need a DNA sample. And he changed it to, we need a pubic hair. Which <laughs> not play with. It was like everybody laughed unintentionally when they heard that line. So, um, but it was a great experience. I I'm, I can't complain. I I mean, it was really was terrific. Can I ask a question? I'm I'm just curious. I mean, I, you're a fantastic writer. Did, are you naturally a good writer, or did you just did you develop it? Did you work at it? I mean, you obviously can work write well and write quickly as well. That how yes. How did you get about doing? How do you go about doing well, that? Your you know, craft? I mean, I've. I've asked myself that same question many, many times. And I really do, I mean, I had no experience, no no inkling or no, um, I didn't want to be a writer when I was a kid. I wanted to be an architect and, you know, I designed buildings that look like hot dogs and stuff like that. But, um, but as far as being a writer, it never occurred to me until I was, you know, in my, in my 20s. Um, and I was a psych major and I got to my senior year at uh, UW and I took a double major. I took psych and English and psych got so incredibly boring. It got into statistical inference. So I switched majors and I went for, um, for writing and creative writing. But um, I don't know. All I can say is I, I, I mean, I, I either feel like a, an imposter or a savant, one of the two. So, um, but I enjoy it. I mean, that's the main thing is like, I just love it. And a lot of my friends who are writers, they absolutely, they despise writing. They like seeing it done, but I mean, I just enjoy the process. And like when I'm, when I'm writing something or writing a script, um, the first thing I do every day is I, I read what I wrote and edit what I wrote just because I, I just love to read it and I love to feel it and be, be around it and touch it. And, um, so to answer your question, I really don't know, <laughs> frankly. Um, well, you've done I, so many big scale things, Michael. I right. mean, uh, Law and Order, Black Sails. What was that yeah. like? I mean, oh, that was that was the first season. Um, in fact, we shot it in South Africa, and I, I have this booklet yet of, of all the design. I, I, I don't know if you can see it, but um. It designed all the ships are are all like um, all designed in there and, and wow this, yeah this has all of the the sets that were built in South Africa we made a deal with the South Africans with the government that if they dug this this pool this giant pool is probably as big as two football fields uh, and it was probably I don't know maybe six feet deep and it had all these gimbals and um, and different pulleys where we, we actually built two life-size replicas of pirate ships. And, and um, we used the pool while we were there and then we gave it to the, to the government. So 
but it was an amazing experience. It really was. So, sure. I mean, got, got black sales there now, and I started yeah. watching it last night because Tony uh, mentioned black sales, and I was right. like, oh my gosh. So we started. I made it to episode three. Just unbelievable cinematography, writing, oh, yeah. line, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, the creators of the show were, were, were pretty sharp. They had done um, some stuff for Disney of all of all places. But um, I had one one kind of weird experience with those guys, and that was um, they were they had not they didn't have as much experience as I did uh, in television working with executives, and they wanted to make the hero they wanted to make him gay. And I was like, yeah, that's great, that's fine, but you really, you know, you're gonna have to run it past the uh, the executive producers and you know all the people at the studios. And they said, no, 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 we want to surprise them. <laughs> I said, oh man, you you can't you can't surprise oh. them like that. Well, not only do we want to surprise them, but we want you to write the episode where the pirate reveals that he's gay. And I'm thinking, oh my God, my my career's over. <laughs> um, so putting you so up. I happen, to, I, I happen to know the um, the producers, and I sort of I went, I did an end around and said, look, these guys, they're they're you know, they're really a little rambunctious, and their their intentions are pure, but they want to do this thing, and and uh, it was God, who was the executive who was running? stars at the time he had hit his girlfriend in the parking lot of uh of a hotel in las vegas and i can't think of his name right now but um my my son worked for him and i knew him pretty well i don't i can't remember his name um from sniffing too much glue and um was it, was it chris albrecht chris albrecht that's right there we I go talked to chris and he said absolutely not do these do these kids understand that our audience is 15 year olds that 15 year old boys and when they find out their hero is gay what are they going to do what are they going to think and these these two guys these two, two partners they just insisted on doing it and they ended up doing it and it worked out just fine so you know there he is there's chris yeah yeah yep. great guy did you, did you have to uh, stay or live in South Africa for the filming or, I mean. No, um, well, what I what you would do is if your episode was being filmed, you'd go and you'd, and you'd stay there while your episode was being prepped and while it was being filmed. So I didn't have to be there for everyone, but I was there for probably like six to eight weeks. Um, and it takes, it's on the, you know, it's it's at the end of the earth. It takes 23 hours to get there. And about. You well, fly into Australia, Florida, you know, with all of the uh, time changes and whatnot, you just, you feel like you're in another world. Um, and we shot it outside of Johannesburg. So, um, but it was a, it was a really terrific experience. And it was a, it was a great show too. Went like seven oh. or eight, seasons, you know. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, 2014. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Episode after episode, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of Game of Thrones, eight, nine uh, series, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Take a couple of months to binge, binge all through it. So. Right. How many writers yeah. were for the show? For Black Sails? There yes. were, there were, let's see, one, two, there were eight of us. And there were, there were, one of them was a writing couple, writing pair. So there were seven, but there were eight writers. So, uh, and that's, that's at the time, that was a very conservative number. I and mean, there were some shows on network television that weren't comedies, that were dramas that had like 15, 16 writers on the show. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Third from the sun, I think 16 different writers sitting around a table, you know, per episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. How many writers yeah. total did you say, Michael, for, for Black Sails? Black Sails had seven seasons. I think seven or eight seasons. Yeah, I left after. I mean, I just I I stayed on for the first um, season, and then I got a deal. I got a, asked to be on another show. That was around the time that um, let's see, what was I doing? Oh, Law and Order: Criminal Intent had just offered me a job, and I really wanted to write 
like crime and and that show. I loved that show when I was a kid. So and it'd been on that long. So how would you get like would you how would you do your research for storylines? For Law and Order? Yes, or anything in general. Well, the research is is you know, that's like the meat and potatoes of, of any show. And you know, thankfully now we have Google and we have all kinds of search engines and but in the very beginning, I don't know how they did it. I mean, now you can you have anything at your fingertips, just about. But um, but for me, like I, I love being submersed in a in in a subculture that I know nothing of, which is um, what I'm doing right now, actually, with the show that I just sold. I'm calling for help. Your Honor. Okay, that's a start. Bing. Today's hottest drama, Law and Order DVD. You it's not. <laughs> one of the longest running, most honest. Jerry Arbach. Jerry Arbach, right? Jerry Arbach, yeah. Law and Order Captain. I was on a show when they had um, Jeff Goldblum was the longest running. He took um, um, Vincent D'Onofrio's place because Vincent D'Onofrio, we fired him because he would. He had some. He had a drinking problem, and then we brought him back because Jeff Goldblum wasn't wasn't sort of up to snuff. Was a great guy, just a terrific guy. But he um, he wore his clothes too tight, and he wanted to play jazz piano in every episode. So <laughs> that, that, you know that, what? It wasn't going to work. So, well, so he's going to probably be a bad thing for him. Yeah, the sister great actor. We just went to see uh, the Sistine Chapel for Michelangelo exhibition. Right, right. There it is. So that was really nice. <laughs> well, to, to, uh, I have to get into a little bit of Monk, though. Uh, sure. What was that like? I mean, that show was a favorite of mine. Um, oh, so, I love it. Yeah, I mean, you, the quirky OCD, that, and yeah. Yeah, that that's actually nice. based. That's based on a real person. Who is the? He is my entertainment attorney's brother. Um, my entertainment lawyer is Tom Hoberman, and Bill Hoberman is who the character is based on. And Bill actually came up with the idea about himself and talked to uh, Andy, the creator of the show. Um, and Andy wanted me to come on the show. And I was already on a show, and he said, "Well, look, can you can you write a couple episodes for us for freelance?" Um, I said, "Sure." And they wrote all the episodes in New Jersey because um, that's where Andy was from. I'm thinking of Andy's last name, and I can't remember right now. Um, but they in Summit, New Jersey, is where they 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 wrote the show. So it was really a terrific experience to go to summit is like cabot cove you know what i mean it's it's just Here's really the, quaint this is the first ever scene of and look at the episodes that he wrote uh in order to get an idea of like to get to get his his rhythm and and his humor um but he, he's a terrific guy as well i mean he's one of the one of the sweethearts that i met in 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 this whole business so um, I don't know what he's doing now. Probably living off Monk, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I th are we out of time? I think we yeah. may be out of time. It's too oh well, I will come back. Will and you I come never, back? I never, I never, I never sure? got a chance to get no, my back black like a helmet out. <laughs> right, right. So many other things to get to. I oh, wanted to man. get to the back surface. Would you well, promise, us, to... promise us you'll come back? Yes, I promise I will. Okay, then on that note, we're going to have to let uh, Michael go for the day. I'm sorry, All everyone. Right. Uh, make, we'll make this part one, and we will definitely okay. tell him to come right. back. Yeah. And Tony, you look like terrific. A three-part three part miniseries, honestly. Thank you. Okay, you all do. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thank Take you. Care, guys.